the first 41 verses. This was a wild day for the church. I mean, it was an outstanding day. And uh, we're going to take a look at those uh, verses uh, this morning. Uh, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of this stir, uh, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other tongues, as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when they, they, this sound occurred, the crowd became, or came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that each hear them in their own language to which we were born? Parthians, Medes, Elamites... Residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Persia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the districts of Libya around Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans, Cretans, I should say, and Arabs, we hear them in their own language speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued amazement with great perplexity, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others were mocking and saying they were full of sweet wine. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judah and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words, that these men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what the prophet this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I'll pour forth my spirit on all mankind. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. And even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth my spirit. And they shall prophesy. And I will grant wonders in the sky above, and the signs in the earth below, and blood and fire, and vapor of smoke. And the sun will be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan for knowledge of God, you nailed to the cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, put an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says to him, I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at my right hand so that I will not be shaken. And therefore my heart was glad and my tongue exalted. And moreover, my flesh also will live in hope because you will not abandon my son to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You have made known to me the ways of life and you will make me full of gladness in your presence. Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. And so because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne, he looked ahead and he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ that he was neither abandoned in Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, 
But he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. And this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent. And each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children, for all who are far off, and for as many of the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. And so then those who had received the word were baptized and that day, there were added about 3,000 souls. I don't know if you know it or not, this is probably one of the most important chapters of the entire Bible. I mean, this is a big, this is the beginning of the church. You might ask, why is it the most important chapter of the Bible? Or one of them. Well, it teaches about the birth of the early church, it also tells us what they believed in the early church teaching. I don't know about you, but I want to know, I want to be as close to the New Testament church as I can possibly be. I want to be so close to the New Testament church and believe what they believed. It's important for me to study Peter's sermon and what he found to be important to present on that day. And so this is an important chapter for not only for us today, but it's for, for all those as we understand this, as we share it with others that we come encounter with. It's a, a very a wild thing that took place for the early church. I mean, we've gone through this transformation uh, of the church. Uh, we've gone from witnessing the death the burial, the resurrection of Jesus, the 40 days of teaching about the, the kingdom of God. We have seen him ascended up into the heavens and Jesus commanding his disciples to go back to, to Jerusalem where they prayed. We've seen them, you know, Peter stood up and he begins to show leadership. The same Peter who denied Jesus three times. And in that meeting that they had, they chose one to replace Judas, who was Matthias. And so now the day of Pentecost has come. Fifty days after Passover was Pentecost. It was a very special festival. And so all these Jews from around the, the world would come from the Roman Empire, would come to Jerusalem for this special festive occasion. And this was the day that God chose to pour out His Spirit upon His church. He wanted something that would catch the attention of the audience. Something that they'll always remember. And here in the book of Acts chapter 2, we find God doing something even more than that. In the first four verses, we on the day of Pentecost, when they'd come, they'd come together, suddenly there came about from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. Now we've had some really violent winds here recently in Arkansas. And uh, we kind of know a little bit about what it might have been like. Maybe some of you have even been, lived through a tornado or been around one. But I can, you can only imagine this violent rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they're sitting. And, and then uh, there appeared tongues of fire distributed themselves, rested on each of them. And it was amazing what was going on. Can you imagine of been, being in a church service just like that? Can you imagine the surprise as, as you, you felt, as you heard the sound of the violent wind and, and the tongues of fire that entered the room and, and the, uh, the, the, the fire splits and, and sections itself on each one of them, on your head. And, and now you begin to praise God in a language that maybe you didn't understand, but it was a, another language uh, of another country. 
And then in the next couple of verses, it says, Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men of every nation under heavens. And, and when this sound occurred, the crowd came together, and they were bewildered by all that was taking place. And, and they were hearing them speak in their own language. They weren't necessarily speaking in an unknown tongue. They were speaking in different languages, as if I were, even though I've never had... Uh, Spanish class, and I wasn't too good in French class, and I, I couldn't ever even begin to speak German. They were able to speak in a different tongue of another nation and, and so forth, and, and they were able to understand what was being said. And they were amazed, they were astonished. Why are not all these are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we each hear them in their own language in which we were born? And there are people around the Roman Empire, the Parthians and the Medes and the Elamites and the from people from Mesopotamia, from what we know today as Iraq and Iran and Pamphylia and, and Egypt and, and Libya and other places like Rome. And they heard them in their own language. And they hear them declaring the, the, the wonders of God and praising Him in their language. That would be pretty wild if that took place right here today. But this was a special occasion, a special time at the beginning of the, the birth of the church. And why uh, would God want to do it that way? Because He wanted something to catch the attention of the crowd. And He wanted to give His church this boost at, at that time and that day, so that they uh, th that they would remember it forever, and probably after they heard this, and that some of this three thousand that were saved that day and stayed in Jerusalem much longer, they took the word of God, they took the message of the kingdom of God back with them to their own country, and so when Paul the apostle went on these missionary journeys, and and later on in the book of Acts, some of them were already believers, and they knew the Word of God and what had happened. And so Peter is there and he, uh, before he speaks though, the, uh, they're, they're kind of mocking these people and say that maybe they've had too much wine. They've had too much to drink. And uh, then Peter, he, he takes his stand with the eleven. He raised his voice, the same shy Peter, who uh, denied Christ when he needed him the most, he raised his voice and declared to them, men of Judah and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. And give heed for my words. For these men are not drunk. These men aren't drunk. It's only the third hour of the day. Now what time would that be? Anybody know? Over here? I'm asking this crowd right here. Third hour of the day. 3 a.m.? 6 a.m.? Third hour of the day. What was it? Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock in the morning they were going on like this. Third, you know, the Jewish... Is this right? Yeah, okay. Because their, their, their day began at six o'clock. And the third hour would have been nine o'clock uh, for them. And so if these men aren't drunk, as you suppose, for it's only the third hour of the day. And then, what, what was the Bible of the New Testament church? It was the Old Testament. And so, Peter goes to the book of Joel, and he quotes from the, the, the book of the prophet Joel. He says, and it shall be in the last days, God says that I'll pour forth my spirit on all mankind. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men will dream dreams. And even my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth my spirit. And they shall prophesy. And so they were fulfilling this prophecy and Peter's helping them to understand all this. 
goes on in, in the book of Joel, and I will grant wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below and blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon and to, the, to, to blood. And before that great and glorious day, the Lord shall come and it shall be everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, since that time, we have been in the last days. Now, we haven't seen uh, the, the, the moon turning into blood unless we consider the four blood moons, you know, or the, the, uh, uh, the, the blood and the fire and the vapor smoke. I think some of these things are still futuristic. But we know since that day, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And so this was the message that they preached. They, they went from the Old Testament. This was their Bible that they would use to preach and they'd find all these prophecies in the Old Testament and they would preach from them and prove that Jesus was the Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ. And he goes on and he declares in verse 22, Men of Israel, listen to these words. He's going to make sense of this prophecy. We've got the text and now we're getting into Peter's sermon. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst. Just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to the cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God... But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. So, as Peter is preaching this powerful message, his message is comprised of, of about five major components here. First of all, God sent Jesus to mankind. God didn't get off his throne and he didn't become in human flesh and die on the cross. But God sent his one and only begotten son to mankind. Jesus of Nazareth was accredited by you, by God to you, by miracles and wonders and signs which God did among through him, through him as you yourselves know. It was not God the Son, it was the Son of God who was the Christ, the Messiah that was prophesied by the prophets. That was the message. And I want to tell you something, there's a lot in this message. In fact, this whole message, we couldn't disagree with it all. Everything here is truth. Who God is, the creator of the universe. The plan of God being fulfilled through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus, literally the Son of God. The second thing, not only had God sent, his, sent Jesus to them, but many in His crowd had, had Jesus put to death. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. It was in the plan of God. Jesus didn't give up His life. Or excuse me, Jesus didn't have his life taken from him, but Jesus gave up his life. Because it was in the foreknowledge, in the plan of God. It was in God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, he's speaking to the Jews, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. And then the third thing he teaches us is that he tells us what death is. Now, if I agree, believed in uh, Greek mythology and, and how the, the scriptures and Christianity has gone away from the, the, the roots of, of, of the Hebrews and the understanding of what death is, I would say, you know, had Jesus been crucified, had He died, He probably was already in heaven. And 
And yet, at one point during that time period before he ascended up, uh, he said, don't touch me because I, you know, I haven't ascended to the Father. And he ascended to the Father and now sits at the right hand of the throne of God. Not only had Jesus been sent to them, he had been crucified, but he didn't stay dead. The Old Testament scriptures teach that the dead are dead. And I don't know how many times it says in scripture that death is asleep. I don't know about you, but when I go to sleep at night, I don't go anywhere. I do have some dreams. I had some wild dreams last night, by the way. But I don't go anywhere. I'm still where I was before. The scriptures teach that death is asleep. Now I want you to consider, you know, Lazarus. You all know the story of Lazarus. Lazarus died and Jesus was called and said, you know, his disciple says he's very sick and you need to go right now. And then finally, uh, Jesus says, well, he's asleep. And the disciples thought, well, if he's asleep, he's going to get better. But Jesus was declaring to them that, no, he was dead. And so, you know, and, and Jesus lingered a little bit longer and finally he went and sure enough, Lazarus was dead. And he was kind of chastised by the sisters there, you know, about not coming a little bit sooner. And he tells them that, you know, he says, you know, I am the resurrection and the life. And uh, he asks if they believed. And they said, yeah, I, in the last day, I believe that there's going to be a great resurrection. And uh, as, as the story goes on, Lazarus was in the tomb and Jesus calls him out of the tomb and he comes forth and he lives. Wouldn't it have been a cruel joke on Lazarus had he been in heaven? Floating around, playing his harp, singing in the choir, uh, floating on clouds and say Lazarus we got another job come on back down the scriptures over and over again speak of death as a sleep a dreamless sleep it ends right there until the resurrection and this scripture teaches us that's what happened to Jesus in this text. Verse 24, let's take a look at it. God raised him up again, putting on an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. God raised him up. Now, if Jesus had been God, he would have had to raise himself up. But God raised him up. By the way, if Jesus had been God, who was taking care of the world during those three days and three nights? I mean, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And yet we have all this Greek mythology has crept into the church and corrupted the truth of what the church believes today. But all we got to do is go back to Acts chapter 2 and understand what the early church believed and then we can have some understanding about what we should believe. Amen? I don't know. It's not that hard. But people have made it difficult. God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death. Did you know David is not in heaven? You would think of all the people in the Old Testament, if there was anybody in heaven, it would be David. Right? That makes sense. 
For David says to him, I saw the Lord always in my presence, and he is at the right hand that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope. This is David in the Psalms. Because you will not abandon me, abandon my soul in Hades. Now a lot of people get tripped up by that word Hades. What does Hades mean in the original Greek? Hades is the grave. Hades is not a, anywhere but the grave. Look it up. Don't take my word for it. I don't get paid to make up things. I get paid to preach the truth. Nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. And you have made known to me the ways of life. You may make me full of gladness with your presence. Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. And so because he was a prophet and he knew that God had sworn to him an oath to sit one of his descendants on his throne, he looked ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was neither abandoned in the grave, you can insert that word, Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses, therefore has been exalted to the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. He has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven. In fact, Jesus said in John chapter 3 and verse 16, no one has gone into heaven. For this, for it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. There's quite a bit here about the kingdom. What was the hope of David? That someone would come and sit on his throne and reign in the kingdom of God. So here we got in this passage of scripture, this Peter preaching. We got the one God. We got the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We got the, the, that death is uh, something that is asleep, that we fall asleep in the grave. We have the power of the resurrection that God raised him up and we have the kingdom message all wrapped up in Acts chapter 2. Isn't that amazing? I don't know about you, I get kind of excited about that. Because if it said anything different, I might preach, be preaching in a different church. And you might be going somewhere else. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that you have made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, where is Jesus now? He's at the right hand of the throne of God, interceding for our sins, our high priest, our mediator between God and man. New Testament preaching right there. He was not abandoned in Hades like David or... David wasn't abandoned in Hades. He's waiting for the resurrection when Jesus comes again. David did not ascend into heaven. But this Jesus now sits at the right hand of the throne of God. Now that's pretty wild preaching there. And I don't know about you, that's when I want to know what I should believe. I want to be as close to the New Testament church as possible. As he goes on now, when they heard this, they were pricked to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent. And each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
It was a wild and powerful message that was preached throughout the New Testament church. You can see it again in Acts chapter 3. You can see it again in chapter 5. You see it when Paul and Silas were uh, uh, in prison. You can see it throughout Paul's preaching. And he stayed two more years to preach about the kingdom of God and, and so on and so forth. And it is said of, in Acts chapter 17 verse 6, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. There's a story about an evangelist who, on, uh, on that very ch text, Acts chapter 17, verse 6, and he began saying, First, the world is wrong side up. And I want to add to that. It, the, the world's inside out. What used to be wrong is right, and what is right has become wrong in our society. The world is wrong side up, he says. Second, the world must be turned upside down. Third, we must be the men to set it right. It's up to us to try to set things right. But this was the message that convinced them, what shall we do? They were pricked in their hearts. I don't know about you, but I remember the day that I, having grown up in church, I remember the day I was pricked in my heart to come forward to be baptized. They were pricked in their hearts. I know how that, how many know how's that, how that feels? Be pricked in your heart. It's the Holy Spirit working on side of us. And when I came down the aisle, I was a, I was a young, little boy. I mean, I was le like 11 years old. And tears just kind of came down my face. I was pricked in my heart. What shall we do? And what did Peter say? Repent, and each of you will be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That word baptism has caused a lot of controversy over the decades, the uh, hundreds and thousands of years. Baptism means dipping and plunging into the waters, into a watery grave. That's what it means. Check it out. Original Greek. Repent, each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Now notice it doesn't say anything else about anybody else or anything else. Be bab You can't find it anywhere else in the New Testament where anything else was being said, uh, being baptized in any other name than the name of Jesus Christ. Peter said, repent, each of you, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I believe it's the Holy Spirit that works in us and through us and fills us with love and joy and peace and long-suffering. And I believe it's the Holy Spirit preaches through me teaches through you, through our witness. Peter said, repent and be baptized. You know, that's kind of offensive to some people. It's offensive that a lot of people object to this message, repent and be baptized. They don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear that they're wrong. You know, it's, I'm okay. You're okay. I don't know about you, but I'm okay. But God says, I'm not okay, and you're not okay. That we're all sinners. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, Paul says, 
all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now the famous singer, I didn't know this until I read this the other day, famous singer Billy Joel got upset and said, this guy is nailed to a cross, dripping blood, and everyone's blaming themselves for that man's torment. But I said to myself, forget it. I had no hand in that evil. I had no original sin. There's no blood on any, uh, there's no blood of, of any sacred martyr on my hands. I pass on all this. But the thing is, we can't pass on any of this. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. We're all pond scum without the grace of God and the blood of Jesus Christ that covers our sins. And Jesus, when he died on the cross, he covered our sins. But it's up to us to repent and be baptized, to go into the waters of baptism, to be buried with Christ, to be raised a new person in Christ Jesus. There is no escape. People of the world think we're crazy. I'm not going to get all wet. That sounds kind of... That's silly. You know, you have to have faith to believe in Jesus Christ. And here's the problem with people. Obedience. Even though, you know, even though the Bible says it, they don't want to obey. Now, if I could figure out a way that you wouldn't have to do all that, I would just plainly tell you how to do it. But it's not my instruction. But the Word of God says, repent and be baptized. We even have the example of Jesus himself going into the waters and being baptized by John. And you know, if people have a problem with obedience, maybe they're not ready. And they could be lost. But this is what happened that day. They heard this. They were pierced to the heart. They said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brother, what shall we do? And Peter said, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I want to tell you, 3,000, the Holy Spirit pricked 3,000 hearts that day. <laughs> That was a wild day. And the Holy Spirit still pricks hearts every, every day. And we can be transformed into new creatures in Christ Jesus. That's why this text is so important. That was New Testament preaching. And it's preaching we need to preach still today.